Sprint to the finish in pivotal swing states just hours before America's decision day. Polarizing pitches to sway undecided voters. November 5th, 2024 will be Liberation Day in America. We have momentum. It is on our side. Can you feel it? And what it means for Canada's economy. There are opportunities and challenges with either candidate. BC port workers locked out, the tens of millions at stake, and the potential impact on holiday shopping. The arrests and suspension of a police officer after violent clashes outside a Hindu temple in Ontario. Plus, reflecting on the legacy of Marie Sinclair, a life dedicated to truth and justice for Indigenous peoples. He is our Martin Luther King for this country. And remembering a brilliant musical mind, Quincy Jones. I've seen the power of music as a tool to reach the hearts and minds of millions of people. The hit-making producer who shaped some of the biggest stars. Fly me to the moon. And most memorable songs. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina reporting tonight from Washington. Good evening, everyone. We are just hours away from polls opening across the United States in one of the tightest presidential races in American history. Both Kamala Harris and Donald Trump are barnstorming across key battleground states, making last-ditch efforts to win over undecided voters. CTV's Washington Bureau Chief Joy Malbin has been following the Harris campaign today, laser-focused with five events in one key state, Joy. Omar, three words, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. Kamala Harris spent her last day in that critical battleground state. Are we ready to vote? Are we ready to win? Kamala Harris choosing to close out her campaign on a hopeful, optimistic message for the future, making her case to a deeply divided nation. And we have an opportunity in this election to finally turn the page on a decade of politics that have been driven by fear and division. We're done with that. We're done. She doesn't say Donald Trump's name, calling him the other guy. Confident her message of unity is resonating with voters in a race stubbornly too close to call. It is time for a new generation of leadership in America. And I am ready to offer that leadership as the next president of the United States of America. Seizing on her overwhelming lead with women, Harris made the battle over abortion central to her campaign, and it's driving them to the polls. A monumental time to be alive. We see a black woman, a mixed woman, running for president. After Trump insulted women and visualized guns aimed at former Congresswoman Liz Cheney's face, the lifelong Republican says... Women are going to save the day in this election. I really, I really believe that. And that comics joke at Trump's rally calling Puerto Ricans garbage is still resonating among the half million Hispanics here. Calling them out, rapper Fat Joe. If you Latino, you Haitian, you black, where's your pride? Where's your pride? Now it's all about getting the vote out. The Harris team says they've knocked on 5 million doors in Pennsylvania alone. She'll watch the results at Howard University here in Washington. Omar? All right, Joy, thank you. And now let's get to CTV's Genevieve Beauchemin, who is in West Palm Beach, Florida, tonight near Donald Trump's campaign headquarters. Genevieve, what's the former president's final pitch to voters? Omar and his push to get out the vote. Trump is urging supporters to, quote, save the country. The era of Trump's trademark campaign rallies ended with a high-paced push through swing states and a familiar catchphrase. And you're going to say that to her. You're going to say, you've done a terrible job. You're grossly incompetent. We're not going to take it anymore. Kamala, you're fired. Get the hell out. After a weekend of railing against the voting system, Trump told supporters the greatest years in American history are within grasp if they vote. Expression, I hate the expression actually, but it's ours to lose. Does that make sense to you? It's ours to lose. If we, if we get everybody out and vote, 
There's not a thing they can do. His voice is now raspy, but he insists he's in fine form. I don't even sleep, you know. You know, I've gone through 62 days, 62 days without a day off. Trump's campaign took him to key states in the Rust Belt, the manufacturing center of the U.S. And the final act in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where he has ended all his previous presidential campaigns, this time in the same arena where he was in 2016 when he won. November 5th, 2024, will be Liberation Day in America. He has made unproven claims his enemies are working hard to steal the vote. And fierce divisions could drive violence have led to tight security at the convention center where Trump is expected tomorrow night, but also at Mar-a-Lago, Trump's waterfront estate. Tomorrow's the big day! Celebration, baby! We're gonna do it! Porters were rallying voters there all day. It's gonna be a close race, but I think we're gonna do it. They say they know Canada and the world are watching closely. Trump was in New York and then Washington on previous election nights. He will be here in West Palm Beach, where he announced 720 days ago that he would run again to be president. Omar. All right, Genevieve, thank you. And CTV's chief political correspondent, Vashi Capellas, joins me now. And listening to those closing arguments today, Vashi, from both candidates, it's clear that each one of them has sharply different visions for America. What stood out most for you? I think two things stood out. First, who they're talking to in these closing arguments. Clearly, it's tens of thousands of voters in Pennsylvania they anticipate will make the difference tomorrow. And that's who their message is aimed at. It's the content of the message, the closing argument, as you point out, that is really striking, right? Both of them want to turn the page, but on different things. Kamala Harris's message in a hard pivot away from talking about Donald Trump is about moving away from the rhetoric, the polarization, the divisiveness that has kind of encompassed the last, you know, eight years, but particularly 2016 to 2020. I think Donald Trump's message is very much focused on trying to tie Kamala Harris to Joe Biden and to the economic record that he knows a number of Americans are unhappy with and to attempt to tell voters, particularly those in those swing states, I can be the one to turn the page on that. So they both want to turn a page just on two very different things and clearly motivate people who might sit at home and stay on, on the couch, basically, to get out and find a reason to vote for them. Whether the argument's worth, obviously, you know, we'll find out maybe tomorrow, maybe a few days after that. And mobilize the vote, and we'll see how America decides in just a few hours. Vashi, thank you so much. Well, whatever America decides uh, tomorrow, whatever the results is, it will have a major impact back at home. And Canada is preparing for either scenario. This afternoon, I spoke with Canada's ambassador to the United States on how the results could affect the diplomatic relationship. Obviously, like everyone, I'm, you know, I'm eager to see how it all turns out. Um, but I know we're ready. They're each protectionist in their own way, way right? We know uh, the manner in which Donald Trump is protectionist. And Kamala Harris was one of 10 U.S. senators who voted against the new NAFTA because she wanted environmental protections. But at the end of the day, is there, is there a better candidate for Canada to protect Canadian interests? I think that there are opportunities and challenges with either candidate. And that's true of any U.S. administration. It depends on the topic you're talking about. So you are, if you mention trade, uh, obviously former President Trump's uh, policy of potentially applying a 10% tariff on all imports from Canada into the United States, that's not good for Canada. But it's not good for the United States. And we've spent an awful lot of time going around this country, talking to Republicans, whose uh, state or community or city benefits greatly from Canada being their number one customer and from Canadian investment and job creation in their, in their region. So we've got sort of the groundwork laid to have that conversation with former President Trump should he enter the White House. You mentioned the word groundwork. What are the lessons that Canadian officials have learned from the first time when he was president that could be applied if he were to enter the White House again mm -hmm. after tomorrow? There's a lot, you know, we've learned a lot. We know him well. Uh, the Prime Minister knows him well. We know him well. Uh, he is very straightforward. You know, oftentimes people think, well, he is saying this particular thing. Maybe he doesn't really mean it. Generally speaking, he does. Like, generally speaking, the policies that he's putting forward are policies that he intends to implement, and we need to take that seriously. What is important to do is to, to get in there early and say, okay, 
here's Canada's value proposition, here's what we should be doing with this relationship, here's how it can make both of us stronger, and you know, and just get to business. He likes to get down to business. With Kamala Harris, we know her Canadian connection. She spent a few years in, uh, in Montreal, of course. What are the major unknowns uh, from, from her? Mm. Uh, I think we know a lot about, about Vice President Harris in her role as Vice President. We worked with her a lot. I have worked with her here in, in Washington on the space file, on the AI file. She's very interested in tech and she's very interested in um, sort of new technologies. Uh, so that'll be interesting to understand where she might want to go with that. As you mentioned, a very strong environmentalist. I think that plays to a lot of Canadian strengths. Um, energy diversity, right? Uh, I think that plays to a lot of our, our strengths. So I'm not, I, I think what is maybe unknown for us is where the specific focus might be in the Canada-US relationship. There's a lot of things that she's interested in that we are very uh, active in as well. So what are gonna be her first priorities? What are gonna be the number one things that she wants to do with us? And I was talking to her senior staff just Friday and her national security advisor just on Friday and we were kind of trying to play through some of that and understand where her, her top priorities might be. Ambassador, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming by. And joining us now is BNN Bloomberg's Amanda Lang. Amanda, the ambassador brought up the threat of those tariffs. If Donald Trump does win after tomorrow and follows through on those tariffs, how devastating could this be for Canada? Devastating. Even economists that say it probably won't happen, it may be a negotiating tactic, are crunching the numbers. And the numbers are bad. It would cost tens of billions of dollars and shave 2.5% off Canada's growth over two years. That would mean a recession. Even worse, of course, would be tariffs like that imposed on other countries who then retaliate. In other words, a global trade war. Nobody wins, Omar. The real bottom line, though, is we need to negotiate with whomever is in the White House uh, after next year because we have a trade deal that expires in 2026 and we need to be on the right foot with the next president of the United States. And this is such a pivotal relationship, the one between Canada and the U.S., more than a trillion dollars worth of two-way trade between the two countries. From an economic standpoint, what else are you tracking, Amanda? You know, the, the promises made here on taxes will matter. We've heard from our business community that they're watching very closely. If corporate taxes in the U.S. should go down, it changes our competitive landscape. We're already facing a little bit of competition because of the Inflation Reduction Act, a big suite of tax incentives for people to invest in the U.S. The thing to remember, though, I think, as we head into tomorrow, Omar, is that we matter to the U.S. as well. Uh, and many state governors would echo that, that our business uh, and the many Canadians that live and work there are important to America and will maybe hang on to the optimism that that will continue to matter as we move forward. All right, Amanda, thanks so much. Let's bring in CTV News political analyst Eric Ham now. Eric, in such a close contest, the ground game is going to be extremely important tomorrow. Who's got the advantage? Well, it's clearly the Harris campaign. We know even when Joe Biden was running for re-election, they were building out their infrastructure to now there are hundreds of field offices all across the country, mostly centered in key battleground states, as well as thousands of people. In fact, we know over the weekend, the Harris camp campaign was literally making 2,000 phone calls every 10 minutes. And so that was a staggering amount. Tonight, we even saw the, the vice president actually door knocking in Pennsylvania as well. All right, Eric, we will talk to you tomorrow. Thanks so much for this tonight. And our special coverage of the U.S. election begins tomorrow at 7 p.m. on CTV News Channel and continues at 11 p.m. on CTV and ctvnews.ca. Millions of dollars in goods entering and leaving Canada are stuck in a holding pattern tonight. Port workers have been locked out after talks broke down last week. And there is concern that the Canadian economy and the upcoming holiday shopping season could take a hit. CTV's BC Bureau Chief Andrew Johnson has the story. Andrew. Omar, one expert calls this a case of high stakes brinksmanship and Canadians do have plenty to lose. The longer this shutdown at the country's largest port drags on. The BC Maritime Employers Association locked out union members starting this afternoon, shutting down terminals from Vancouver all the way up to the Alaskan border in response to job action by the union. One of the main issues is staffing requirements as more automation is introduced. $800 million of trade moves through BC's ports every day. Business groups say an extended shutdown could be a disaster for retailers and manufacturers. Some are suggesting the holiday shopping season could even be affected. There are calls for Ottawa to get involved. The Labour Minister has offered up federal mediators.
Analysts believe there would be tremendous pressure on Ottawa to come up with some kind of a solution if this supply chain disruption were to last for more than a few days, especially with inflation finally getting under control and a potential election looming in 2025. Omar. All right, Andrew, thank you. Coming up. They entered in the property and they hit with, with, the, with the stick. This is, this is very unfortunate and uh, it is not acceptable. Anger over an attack outside an Ontario Hindu temple. An eruption of violence between Sikh separatists and worshippers outside an Ontario Hindu temple has led to arrests, political condemnation and the suspension of a police officer. Here's CTV's Raheem Lavani. Many people stand here. Azad Goyet was here at the Hindu Sabha temple on Sunday afternoon, taking part in a financial workshop for seniors, which was being led by consular officials from India. Who's a terrorist? India! It was their presence that brought six separatists to the place of worship, holding banners in support of the Khalistan movement, which is seeking to create a separate sovereign state for six within India's Punjab province. Social media video shows demonstrators clashing with those at the temple, with people being hit with flags and sticks. They entered in the property and they hit with, with, the, with the stick. This is, this is very unfortunate and it is not acceptable. Among the group of demonstrators is believed to be an off-duty police officer. Peel police say they are aware and that this officer has since been suspended. Another video shows a uniformed police officer swinging his fist into a crowd before grabbing a stick. Whosoever was involved in, in the, 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 using, the, using the inappropriate uh, force uh, against the devotee, they must be terminated. Canadian officials at all levels of government are condemning the violence. Local councillors say tensions are mounting within the South Asian community. It's getting very political, it's getting very nasty, um, especially when it gets drawn on uh, religious lines. Later that night, two more demonstrations emerged, this time in Mississauga, including one at the Sri Guru Singh Sabha Maltin Gurdwara. Sikh groups say the demonstrators were not Sikh protesters, but instead part of a pro-India group. Police arrested and charged three people. I hope that those responsible are held fully accountable. Um, and I think that will be a chilling effect for those that want to copycat this, this incident. There are limits uh, to the right to protest. The incident comes weeks after Ottawa expelled six Indian diplomats, linking them to the killing of a Sikh separatist leader in 2023 on Canadian soil. It has accused the Indian government of conducting a broad campaign against South Asian dissidents in Canada, something New Delhi denies. Raheem Ladani, CTV News, Toronto. Still ahead. Remembering Murray Sinclair, a key architect of reconciliation. Canadians are mourning the loss of a man tonight who led the country on a journey to confront a dark past and helped guide the process of truth and reconciliation. Murray Sinclair was an Indigenous trailblazer who died today at the age of 73. CTV's Michael Couture on his remarkable life and contributions. Throughout his life, Murray Sinclair tried to shine a light on the dark corners of Canada's history, searching for the truth and paving the way for reconciliation. It was education that got us into this, and it will be how we educate our children going forward that will get us out of this. As the head of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, he led Canada through a reckoning with its past abuses of Indigenous peoples in residential schools. In a statement, his family said Sinclair committed his life in service to the people, creating change, revealing truth, and leading with fairness throughout his career. The deep convictions and immovable strength he brought to bear on such extraordinary challenges were an inspiration to all of us. Sinclair spent six years documenting the stories of thousands of residential school survivors. It resulted in 94 calls to action and an awakening across the country. He is our Martin Luther King for this country. He saw something that none of us could even envision and brought us all along in that journey of reconciliation. Born in Selkirk, Manitoba, Sinclair was the first Indigenous judge in that province and just the second in Canada. 
Sinclair's traditional name means the one who speaks of pictures in the sky. The story behind it, of course, is about a young man who goes out to, to seek answers in order to help his people who are living in troubled times. After delivering the TRC report, he was appointed as a senator where he continued his work to make the country a better place for all. He would listen to these places as stories of learning, of possibility, so that we could create a better future for everyone's kids. Marie Sinclair was 73. Mike LeCouture, CTV News, Ottawa. A courageous leader and an inspiration. After the break. Remembering the hit-making musical genius who raised the bar and set the tone. The standard set by Quincy Jones will be hard to beat, widely considered one of the most influential forces in American modern music. The entertainment world is mourning the loss of a titan tonight. CTV's Adrian Gobriel with more on the legendary maestro who knew how to make stars shine. Quincy Jones's fingerprints have touched nearly every genre of popular music. Before discovering his musical genius, he was a young boy trying to navigate the Great Depression. Quincy Delight Jones Jr. was born on the south side of Chicago. He picked up a trumpet and found his passion after his family moved to Seattle. That's where he met Ray Charles, who encouraged Jones to try his hand at arranging music. It's my party and I Jones' first major commercial success came in 1963 when he helped produce Leslie Gore's It's My Party. Though it was his work and friendship with Frank Sinatra that helped Jones break down racial barriers and into the music scene. Fly me to the moon. With Jones arranging and conducting Sinatra's Fly Me to the Moon. And we had the best time. It's like being on another planet with him. Frank would say, Q, live every day like it's the last and one day you'll be right. Though his musical gift to the world was nearly cut short, Jones suffered two brain aneurysms in 1974. He recovered and went right back to work. <laughs> producing albums for Aretha Franklin, George Benson, and Michael Jackson. This, this day, this Thriller became the best-selling album of all time. Jones received 28 Grammy Awards over his career. Also produced We Are the World for Famine Relief in Africa. Love, laugh, live, and give. That's what it's about. Reflecting on the average life expectancy, Jones once said, you only live 26,000 days. I'm going to wear them all out. While the maestro of modern music has departed, the songs he produced promised to live for an eternity. Quincy Jones was 91 years old. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. Just an incredible life and legacy. That's a snapshot of this Monday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and see you again tomorrow from Washington. <laughs>